Our first speaker today is uh, uh, Agu, uh, Gabor Egri, uh, who will present on non-territorial, non-autonomy. Uh, Gabor Egri is a historian, director general of the Institute uh, of Political History in Budapest, Hungary. His research interests are nationalism, everyday ethnicity, politics of identity, and politics of memory in modern East Central Europe. And he is the principal investigator of a wonderful ERC project uh, in Budapest uh, titled Nepostrans, Negotiating Post-Imperial Transitions from Remobilization to Nation-State Consolidation, a comparative study of local and regional transitions in post habsburg and East Central Europe. Thank you, Gabor, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Notes. I hope everything will work out fine. Okay, I hope you can hear me. So, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, for the possibility to present here at this wonderful conference, uh, especially because I had the chance to somehow uh, have a perspective on the beginnings of this project, and it's really great to see how wonderfully it evolved uh, 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 with the work of this uh, of a wonderful team. Uh, uh, when Bernice mentioned uh, in his introduction how much Renner actually complained about how few people he thought uh, was reading his works, uh, I realized that the copy I was using 15 years ago, and when I was preparing this paper, I used the gain from the library of my institute, uh, attest to the wide readership of Renner's. It holds an ex libris uh, with the name Henrik Kishmartoni, who was actually a Hungarian banker, one of the higher, uh, one of the high officials of a Hungarian uh, commercial bank from Pest. And if you Google his name, or if you put his name in the search engine of, the Hung of this uh, Arcanum digital uh, uh, repository of Hungarian newspapers, the uh, most frequent context his name appears is actually not even banks and business, but football. He was one of the leaders of the Hungarian Football Association in the interval period. I don't know how much Render would have approved <laughs> this activity, but nevertheless, he doesn't seem to be a guy who, or a person who was theoretically involved in this discussion, and still he had this copy of Render's in his personal library. Uh, and I think this is something that I could also uh, uh, admit to, uh, a kind of uh, fascination with the work of a thinker uh, who inspires very much. And this, is, this was the starting point of this presentation as well. Uh, uh, one, a few pages uh, in the work Das Selbstbestimmungsrecht der Nationen caught my eyes 15 years ago and somehow it's, I realized recently how much it influenced my thinking about history, statehood in East Central Europe, especially in the transition period I was, uh, I'm looking at within my own project. Uh, and these few passages actually consist of an argument about why non-territorial autonomy would not be a novelty in Austria, in Cisleitania, rather just a sanctioning of the facts on the ground. De facto autonomy, according to this argument, existed already. So I was thinking about how much it could be applicable, what kind of benefits it could bring if we try to take it as a kind of theorization of the state and try to apply to a diff very different context, interval Romania, which was a centralized state and which is commonly known about the lack of any kind of minority rights uh, in, uh, in interval period. Uh, most importantly, because when I was working on everyday ethnicity uh, in Romania, I have found actually very similar things that we are render theorized in these few pages. So I will start with a summary of Renda's argument. I will try to give the main characteristics of what I think 
uh, interval Romania's uh, very practical de facto minority regime uh, seem to be, and then I will try to draw some conclusions regarding uh, the benefits of non-territorial autonomy and also statehood, how much it confirms uh, Render's uh, argumentation. Uh, so these few pages are just actually eight pages from, uh, from this uh, first edition uh, published by Deutike uh, in Leipzig. And this is summed up is about that non-territory uh, autonomy would only recognize existent, uh, existing arrangement legally and it would be beneficial for the state as it would replace unpredictable informality with formalized structures, bringing stability, decreasing conflict over national issues. Uh, this is the last point that practically connected with the main argument of the work, at least according to my reading. Uh, and uh, just to highlight how much it was important for Render himself, I uh, would draw your attention to this uh, citation and especially that uh, sentence where uh, he mentions that I consider it of crucial significance even for the legal systematic. Right? systematic. Uh, so in a sense, he de definitely thought about this kind of practical arrangements he was theorizing about uh, in these eight pages as something that is very fundamental for the state and the law of the state. What is it what Brenda was actually uh, uh, thinking about? So the argument starts with decentralization, which he qualifies not as part of constitutional law, but as administrative law. That's a, pr probably legal scholars, it's a very important difference for historians, not necessarily that meaningful. Uh, and he uh, defines uh, decentralization as any kind of uh, multiplication of the decision-making levels within the state, therefore somehow uh, bringing decisions farther from the ministries that are actually the state in this reading. Uh, and he argues that any kind of decentralization will breach the uniformity of the state because uh, those who are exercising decision-making uh, a jurisdiction uh, at those lower levels or in different institutions and ministries will somehow develop uh, a kind of habit and custom, a kind of customary uh, execution of the law and uh, administration of the country. And uh, he also argues that it's actually a substitute for federalism. Uh, he gives the example of the Galician Poles who exercise it through political influence. Also, he gives an uh, uh, example or uh, a more general example of how certain uh, provincial administrations were better stuffed with much more experienced and much more uh, educated administrative personnel than the central administration, making them practically uh, the, uh, the real rulers of, of the provinces they were uh, administering. Uh, the next step in the argument is a definition of self-government, self as, uh, as an entity that has its own statute, its own, uh, it, it exercises self-administration and it has the right of self-adjudication. Uh, Renner again argues that it's almost a law of nature that if large ethnic groups exist within a state, and it was obviously the case in Cisleitania at least, uh, due to their political influence, or due to the political influence of the elites, something similar will develop. And he sums up, brings together these three aspects as Sonderstaatlichkeit, because, as he argues, it entails all the three branches of the, uh, of the government. Uh, nevertheless, and this is the, so, the kind of sociological observation, uh, that it is, according to the argument, very much ephemeral in Austria, because large part is definitely ex uh, influence on several decisions of the ministries, but the changes within the parties affected this informal autonomy. The personnel who was, in a sense, involved within this autonomy, either in the form of uh, uh, nominations promoted in different branches of the uh, government by certain parties, or the policies that these uh, administrative organs pursued or the practices that were developed. And this is also very important, I think. Uh, nevertheless, 
as it uh, entails all the three branches of the government, for Renner, it's a kind of informal autonomy that only needs sanctioning by legal means. Uh, it's important that it's not a full-fledged federal state in the sense uh, most uh, legal scholars would have understood the state, but for Renner, it was not a problem because he started to somehow uh, dissociate certain aspects of the state and reorganize. The idea was to reorganize certain aspects as states without jurisdiction over other matters. Uh, therefore, he was even ready to conceptualize this kind of no legally sanctioned autonomy as a new form of federal statehood without actual territorial extent or with a kind of uh, combined territorial extent kind of uh, uh, condominium over the lower levels of the administration, the uh, uh, district, that's here. Uh, and it's also interesting, uh, Renner, do not uh, mention it, but uh, there are some kind of uh, arrangements or at least historiography lists certain uh, cases that could somehow be aligned with this idea of Renner. So just starting from this kind of very theoretical uh, uh, points Renner made. So, for example, Joachim von Putkamer argued in his book uh, on the Hungarian uh, school policies uh, in dualist Hungary that actually the original idea of Josef Utvash with the uh, uh, Nationalities Act was not just simply regulate uh, language use, but also to align it with a kind of educational autonomy that would have been managed by uh, the denominational communities with, and this is very important, with uh, establishing a kind of representative autonomous body within the Catholic Church itself, as it existed within the Orthodox churches or within the Protestant churches. And uh, to a certain extent, what the incipient Romanian governing body of Transylvania, and this is where the story is extending towards interval Romania as well, imagined uh, to implement in those territories which became under its rule at the end of 1918 and throughout 1919, uh, a kind of extension of denominational school system and uh, granting the right to use uh, everyone's language in all branches of the government, not just the administration. Uh, but it did not last too long and interval Romania was a very different kind of state. It was centralized, its administration was monolingual, uh, it's attempted to homogenize its whole legal system, even though the unification was incomplete and very important fields of the law, for example, remained uh, uh, disuni disunified, so to say, uh, like the commercial law or the civic law. Uh, actually, uh, in the 30s, probably it was the last, one of the last, uh, uh, regions uh, of uh, the world where the Austrian civic code from the mid-19th century was still uh, valid and uh, actually low, used to adjudicate uh, legal cases. Uh, and if we look at the education system that was certainly expanding the denomination uh, in the first few years of Romanian rule, uh, it started to decline as soon as the centralizing policy and state building effort uh, kicked in in Romania. Uh, and the extent of the use of Romanian within the uh, educational system was also just growing. Uh, and more importantly, uh, Romania was a country where uh, the, uh, the Romanian majority was uh, over 70% and not one of the uh, ethnic minorities was significant enough to carry the same political weight at the national level as some of the uh, non-German uh, political parties could uh, in Cisleitania before the First World War. So I wouldn't say that what Renner uh, diagnosed, so to say, was given in Romania and still, and this is where my argument starts, uh, if we look at the practices of the administration and the education, we can find something that is uh, analogous with what Renner observed or theorized uh, for uh, Cisleitania. First, uh, we can see that the use of the non-Romanian languages persisted in the, within the administration at least up to the uh, mid-90s. And it is also so very important uh, that uh, as the internal language and 
as an external language of administration, at least in a verbal form, it practically was uh, uh, persisted up to uh, the Second World War. Uh, although through some kind of informal arrangements and at the lower levels of the administration, but it was a systemic feature of Romania's administrative system that people, when they went to the local uh, administration, could somehow manage to uh, mm, uh, manage their affairs and issues with the administration in their uh, mother tongue. In most of the cases, as in and every informal arrangement, it was also prone to some kind of abuses uh, as well. Uh, the judiciary was definitely monolingual, uh, and within the educational system, uh, the use and importance of minority languages was declining, most importantly after the introduction of the uh, uh, replacement of the Matura exam with the baccalaureate, the French uh, modern baccalaureate, which uh, was a Romanian language exit point towards the universities, so that meant that actually the mother tongue was mostly useful at the uh, primary education level and if one wanted to go uh, to university abroad. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would say that to a certain extent, uh, Renner's point on the effects of decentralization is definitely uh, clearly uh, visible in inter Romania. Uh, mostly through the personnel uh, of the judiciary and the administration. While we have a politicized higher echelon of the administration at the county level, uh, we see uh, much more stability than it, was, it is usually assumed at the lower levels of this administration. And the per, uh, personal composition of this administration is, even if it's not necessarily uh, reflecting uh, ethnic ratios, although, again, uh, if we calculate ethnic ratios, we would see that uh, at these lower levels of the administration, the ethnic minorities were present more or less according to their uh, ratio within the, pro uh, within the uh, uh, population of the province of Transylvania or uh, maybe also in Bukovina. Uh, uh, local political alliances also uh, provided some kind of influence on the personal composition of this, uh, of the administration. And even if it did not necessarily mean that minority parties could install their own minority cadres in the administration, they could certainly influence who probably a more amicable figures uh, were installed in the crucial key positions of the administration as well. And this stability also definitely led to a kind of customary administrative practices that render, that are uh, crucial for Renner's argument as well. In the, within the judiciary, we can see that the continuity of the law and to a certain extent, the continuity of the personnel, also minority ones uh, up to the end of the 1920s, uh, created this kind of uh, tension around the interpretation of the existing law, which was to a certain extent uh, the old law of Hungary uh, and Austria, and to a certain extent, the new law of Romania, uh, uh, which was actually about the authentic uh, interpretation of the existing laws. And this was very much a kind of uh, regionalist provincial issue as well, very often. So even if it's not, this, not the Sondergerichtsbarkeit that Renner describes in, in the argument, it's definitely more than just uh, the customary differences of individual judges about how to uh, interpret certain legal provisions. There is a kind of idea of authentic Transylvanian or authentic Bukovina uh, uh, interpretation of the law that is coming back to that kind of uh, informal arrangement, which is, and this is very important, uh, definitely not a non-territorial autonomy. Even though, if you look at the practices, the situation of minorities was less detrimental in inter Romanian than uh, most of the political commentators uh, stated, uh, and the le formal legal provisions entailed, uh, it's, uh, this kind of arrangement provided less minority party influence, and they were much more patchy than in the case of Latinia, not least because 
Romania lacked the institution of a province, which was, I think, quite crucial for the influence of, of minority or non-German political parties uh, in this light. Therefore, the effects of decentralization were more general. So they entered not only that kind of ethnically definable uh, informal autonomy that Render uh, supposed to find within Utrecht, uh, but and this is uh, and uh, it also means that it were uh, it was uh, uh, if we look uh, uh, or, or if we look at the issue for whom was it detrimental? Uh, why Render postulates that no, not accepting uh, the informal autonomy, not sanctioning the informal, was detrimental to the state. In this case, uh, this non-sanctioning of the, uh, these informal arrangements was visibly much more detrimental to the minority communities. Uh, nevertheless, and this is where I think uh, uh, one can also connect these uh, Romanian specificities, which were not just Romanian specificities, obviously, uh, with Render's ruler argument. If we look at where we can identify, we can locate this kind of informal arrangement. Those are the local uh, level. And again, going back to Renner, for Renner building up these uh, interesting uh, dissimilar states within one federal uh, state was actually the district, uh, the Betsir. So there is something, because we see these local uh, informal arrangements that probably had the potential for developing towards this kind of broader informal autonomy. The question is why it didn't happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very, mu Thank you very much, Gabor Egri. And now I will give the microphone to my colleague, Marina Germane, who will in introduce our next speaker. Uh, our second speaker today is Piet Gummens. Uh, Piet is a philosopher and a political theorist by training with a very long-standing interest in nationalism, group, uh, individual and group rights, and Austro-Marxists. Uh, his PhD thesis from the University of Pavia was a normative defense of non-territorial autonomy. And he is currently working on a book about Renner and his plan for the reform of uh, the ha uh, Habsburg monarchy. And today he will talk to us about Renner's internationalism and also to some extent about his uh, nationalism. Is there a way to, thank you <laughs> for those kind words. Is there a way to um, uh, turn the PDF into a old screen in Windows? Got it, yeah, okay, <laughs> it's fine. Okay, uh, let me start by um, uh, warmly thanking the organizers of the conference, uh, a conference well organized, I would say. Also warmly thank you for your kind words again. Uh, and let me jump right into it. Um, yeah. So when I read the call for papers and the question why was non-territorial autonomy not more successful in practice, one important answer that came to my mind was Renner's internationalism. Renner thought that the future would be international with a stronger international government, something like the European Union on the continental level and something even stronger than the United Nations today on the global level. Um, he designed his reform plan accordingly, and so it better fits such a strong international arrangement, and that is the thesis that I will argue for. When you give a presentation about Renner's internationalism, then his German nationalism becomes unavoidable, because it somewhat goes into the direction of those greater Germany ideas that the Nazi regime took to their eventual conclusion. So in the first part, I'll say something about Renner's German nationalism. Then I'll present his internationalism, and in the last part, I'll argue that his reform plan, so his version of non-territorial autonomy, better fits a strong international government. Let me then start. Yeah, so that's uh, the, the, 
the layout of the presentation. And I start with uh, part one, uh, Renner's possible German nationalism. Discussing this is obviously difficult. On the one hand, if I want to present in a balanced way, then my whole paper would be about nothing else than this topic. On the other hand, I do not want to take, I do not, I do want to take into account these possible and justified objections. So the solution that I went for in the paper is to give a list of some serious mistakes that Renner made as a politician, but I'll leave it at that and I won't further comment on this list, but feel free to ask about the missteps. Uh, so the list is provided by Sage, Sages, Richard Sages' uh, biography um, and I'll just read it out loud. Renner was close to the annexation politics of the central powers during World War I. He withdrew hastily as president of parliament in 1933, installing then the fascist regime of Dolfus. Uh, he publicly said that he would vote, he didn't install himself the fascist regime of Dolfus. Uh, he publicly said that he would vote yes in a Nazi organized referendum to ratify the Anschluss. He justified the Munich Agreement. He made excluding judgments after the Second World War concerning the future of Jews in Austria. I would add two other uh, things to this list, which is um, his colonialism or strong Eurocentrism that you find in his texts, and his Russophobia, uh, which, as we will see later on, are important to his internationalism. Now, my my stance on this is that Renner was a soft German nationalist. And by this, I mean two things. First of all, I mean that he was a kind of passive nationalist. Um, he did not play a major active role in instigating uh, German nationalism, but he did reproduce or, or um, try to justify the German nationalist ideas that went around among if, what were eventually his voters, um, uh, German-speaking Austrians. Uh, the second thing that I, that this soft German nationalism means is that he had, uh, that he often underbuilds his theses or his, his, his theories with non-nationalist arguments. So very often with even Marxist arguments, which from a perspective of nationalism are of course non-suspect. Now to further back up this reading as, of Renner as a soft German nationalist, uh, let me give two quotes, one from Anton Pelinka, the famous political scientist, who in a previous life did some work on uh, Karl Renner, also publishing a biography. So to quote, Renner was always embedded in the main current of the Austrian public opinion. He never resisted this main current. He represented the zeitgeist that was dominant in Austria at the time. And further, Renner was not capable of resisting the then prevailing zeitgeist. He rather lent himself to a theoretical explanation of this prevailing zeitgeist. And in that way, he also at least indirectly justified it. And so the passive elements in green embedded in uh, the public opinion representing the zeitgeist, not capable of resisting the zeitgeist. And then the, the non-theoretical, um, non-nationalist arguments, he underbuilt it with a theoretical explanation. Second quote, Saga, who is a bit more uh, gentle towards Renner. So to quote Saga, Renner's capacity to put himself in a position and the mentality of the common people certainly had the advantage that he, like almost no other Marxist theorist, was capable of reconnecting politics with the life and labor world of the masses. Could it be possible that the price he, had to, he paid for this was that he did not always resist the danger of reproducing the prejudices of the common people? So again, the, these passive elements, reconnecting with the life and labor world of the, of the masses, reproducing, and then this reference to Marxist theorist uh, um, testifies to his, his non-nationalist non arguments. Okay. What does this imply for reading Renner and for his internationalism? So, I think we cannot dismiss him, that we are certainly more than allowed to keep on reading him. Um, and I think that most of his arguments are also sincere. But at the same time, we should also read him with a lingering doubt in the back of our heads. Did he maintain the right balance? Is this or that argument not informed too much by a widely held opinion that we now know to be false? So there is this twofold approach that I came to uh, after reading Renner. On the one hand, lingering doubt in the back of your heads, but in the other, on the other hand, also still reading him and finding him interesting. 
Then I come to my second part, um, so a presentation of his internationalism as such. Um, and his internationalism, just like his reform plan, is characterized by a double organization. One organization encompassing the institutions of national autonomy and the other one dealing with socioeconomic affairs. Um, so in his reform plan, there is also this double organization. You have the institutions of national autonomy on the one hand, and you have the state institutions, the socioeconomic institutions, the socioeconomic organization on the other. Uh, and so when Renner talks about the international, then we are talking about the suprastate level of this socioeconomic of this socioeconomic organization. And these socioeconomic organizations are shared by different nations, and in that sense, they are international. Now, Renner's theory on the international fits into his sociology of law. It fits together with Bauer's theory on imperialism. Renner, Renner has an argument about the role of the proletariat in bringing about the international. He has an argument about uh, whether the international, as he uh, sees it, is not too utopian, etc., etc., etc. But the core of his theory of, of internationalism is what he calls the commercial community, the Verkehrsgemeinschaft. Commercial communities are formed by specific geo-economic geo features. So straits like um, Gibraltar, Suez, or Panama, rivers like the Danube or the, the Rhine, uh, ports like Antwerp. And these are all examples that Renner gives at a certain point. But also things like um, economic interdependence between a rural and a, an urban area, or things like um, the dependence or the interdependences generated by natural resources. Um, and so there is also a European and a global uh, community, uh, commercial community. These commercial communities in the time of Renner's writing did not have the political units that they deserved, according to Renner. They need political units that, units that manage things like Suez, ports, rivers, for all the commercial communities or all those in the commercial communities that are affected. There are many commercial communities, as you can say. Renner imagines a whole hierarchy, a whole overlapping plethora of commercial communities, all demanding either their administrative unit or their political unit, which I'll come to in the third part. The international political units that Renner prefers or takes most seriously are the Central European ones. And these are suspiciously, of course, German-dominated ones. But nonetheless, I think his internationalism is sincere. Um, he already developed the main elements of his thinking about the international in an article and a booklet published before this, the First World War. He sticks to it after the Second World War. As we will see in the next part, his internationalism is also part, is also not ad hoc, it's part of his whole theory. Um, he also gives, again, interesting arguments for his internationalism, often Marxist-inspired arguments. And finally, his choice for Central European units uh, is indeed partly explained by his nationalism, but partly also by his Eurocentrism, his colonialism, and his Russophobia. Because of his Russophobia, he excludes Russia. Because of his Eurocentrism, he focuses on European units, although he does imagine in a utopian future also a world unit. And because of his colonialism, in a sort of indirect way, he excludes England and France because he thinks in these terms of a forming a continental bloc against uh, the colonial empires of England and France. So I think it's, or I would conclude that uh, the eventual form of his internationalism is informed by his nationalism, but that uh, the core of his internationalism and the whole theory and arguments that he uh, um, develops there are genuine. And hence, I come to part three uh, of my presentation. Um, so the question, why is Renner's plan more suited for a strongly internationalized world? Well, basically because a strong international order would balance out his reform plan. And to understand this, I have to delve a bit into his reform plan. So, and by his reform plan, I always mean his version of non-territorial autonomy. So the backbone of Renner's reform plan is a unified state structure. Now, this may be a federal unified state structure, so it uh, may have the competences or powers on certain matters, but not on other matters, like education and culture, which go to the nations. Um, it may also be a stretched out unified state structure, uh, by which I mean that you can have a division of legislative, executive, 
administrative tasks uh, between all the different levels in this state structure. But in the end, and this is very important to Renner, it needs to be a unified state structure. So with political will formation in the center, in the legislative, in the center, um, contact with the citizens at the edges uh, through the local administration, but also clear lines of ministerial authority through this, uh, these administration hierarchies. Um, so in the end, everything perfectly fitting together, consistently fitting together, and the result being a coherent whole. That is very much the kind of thinking that Renner uh, does. Now, the main reason why Renner's plan is implemented in the nation state world, uh, why if it, it is implemented in the nation state world is unbalanced, is that this unified state structure would speak for Renner German. Uh, and this of course, uh, another reason to keep uh, a lingering doubt in the back of our heads. Uh, now we could say that perhaps this is still okay, that perhaps Renner's reform plan should not be seen as a first step towards German nation building, that while well, there was this tradition of uh, German speaking in the administration of the Habsburg monarchy, or well, uh, the choice of German was in a way logical uh, in the Central European area because of its status as a lingua franca. We could say all that. But if we implement Renner's plan in a nation state world, we are not only saying that. In a nation state world, Renner's plan uh, is an unbalanced because we add national sovereignty to his plan. We implement Renner's reform plan in one state, otherwise we would have to come together uh, all European nations or all nations of the world and decide we are going to implement non-territorial autonomy. We are not doing that, so we are de facto always implementing um, Renner in one nation state. And when we do so, we add sovereignty to Renner's plan. But sovereignty does a number of things. It adds legitimacy. Uh, it legitimizes the dominant position of the majority nation, uh, which is ratified in a way. It gives the majority nation the levers of power, the state structure. Uh, it cements the relation between minority and majority on the long term. The majority, if it doesn't violate any human rights, will have for the definite or for an indefinite period this situation. So in short, Renner's plan is unbalanced in the nation state world because it does not give much power to uh, the minority to fight things out with uh, the majority. And this fighting things out with the majority, this is very much Kim Lika's, uh, argument uh, or that a minority needs. This is, of course, unfair to minority nations, and that, I think, partially explains why Renner's plan was not more successful in practice. Political elites confronted with a national problem did not choose Renner's model because of this unfairness, this uh, lack of balance. But the correct reading of Renner's plan does not add sovereignty. The correct reading places his reform plan into a strong international order. And with the strong international sovereignty disappears um, and with strong internationalism, sovereignty disappears from his reform plan. Um, Renner breaks up sovereignty into its components and then disperses those components. He breaks up sovereignty in the sense that he replaces it with several competences or powers in the sense of a federal division of powers. And then he disperses those powers to the sub and the supra state levels. And now we come uh, to the point where Renner shows his consistency we can simply put uh, the substate socioeconomic organization underneath the suprastate socioeconomic uh, organization that we saw in the previous part. So there is something similar to the commercial communities on the substate level. On the substate level, Renner more often calls them uh, economic communities, so Wirtschaftsgemeinschaften. Um, um, so from the local to the global level, there, are then the, there is then the following list of administrative units uh, or political units. Uh, on the local level, you have the locality, commune, district, and kreis, which I present by one uh, bowl in order not to get a too cluttered presentation. Uh, then you have the level of the province, the governance, the federal area. Then you have the state level. Then you have the regional and the continental, and in the end, the global level. So the powers are dispersed over certain of these units, turning them, you could say, into polities instead of administ mere administrative units. 
Um, and so on a sub-state level, certain powers go to the Kreise and the federal area. And the result is that not only national sovereignty disappears, but also the state. Remember that education and culture go to the nations, and to this, the powers that go to the Kreise and the federal area uh, must be added. And what is left for the state is just a meager sum of powers. But if we implement Renner's reform plan in, an, in a strongly internationalized world, then we still have to take into account the suprastate level and give certain economic, financial, military powers to the different international levels. So in the end, there is nothing special about the state level. It's just one level among many. It's not the obviously most important level with most of the powers as it is in our nation state world. Okay, let me then once more return to um, uh, language and nationalism. So take a regional organization like the European Union. The situation is different from the one that was most prominent in Rennes' uh, international thinking. In the European Union, German competes with and loses from English as the most useful language of communication. Now, based on what he writes, Renner would have endorsed the strengthening of the European Union, even if this implied that German would be dethroned as the language of communication. Moreover, and again, based on what he writes, one could argue that Renner nowadays would choose English as the language of most of the state structure of such an international polity. And English would make much more sense given its status as a lingua franca. Finally, and arguably still based on what he writes, one might even wonder whether Renner's priority for the smooth functioning and so the unified state structure would imply that he opts for English throughout this whole state structure all the way down up until the level of the Kreis, as he says somewhere uh, that this is the level where the national language would switch, switch into uh, the, the lingua franca, German in his case, I am proposing English. In any case, switching, switching from German to English is an easy fix to Renner's soft German nationalism, insofar as it stains, as it stains his reform plan. And notice then also how much, uh, how such a fix leaves his whole system intact. To conclude, after characterizing Renner as a soft German nationalist, I presented his theory of internationalism and the core concept of commercial communities therein. My argument was that Renner's reform plan is designed for a world with strong international polities instead of, an, of a world with nation states. In a world of nation states, Renner's, Renner cannot fulfill one of the core elements of his plan, dispersing sovereignty. With sovereignty, Renner's plan is unfair towards minority nations, which is one of the main reasons why it was not more successful in practice. But let me end on a positive note. If this interpretation of Renner is correct, then the reverse might also be true. Renner's plan implemented in a strong international order is balanced. Provided then that the current surge in nationalism is merely reactionary, Renner's plan might still have a bright future ahead. Thank you for your attention.